At approximately November 8, just before November 8, 2012, the Holy Spirit granted me a, it was like an out-of-body uh, Uh, experience of being uh, put into the past and that was at the uh, the wedding at Cana of Galilee and I would like to speak regarding uh, the wine that was served and this is just just amazing when I when I go back to read this and and I, I see, I, I can see myself there. I, I can still see the vision. I can still see the experience. It was, it was deeper than a vision. It was like I was teleported back in time out of my body. I was just there watching. And I, I could see Jesus. I was looking right at, in the direction of Jesus. And he was looking at his servants. And, and the, his, his, his demeanor, his, 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 own, his own person was just... Uh, he was the uh, obviously the epitome. He was the, the the most holiest person. And what I saw is exactly what's written in John chapter two, and exactly what happened. The uh, what the scriptures reveal also in Luke chapter five, verse thirty-seven. What I saw is exactly what is explained here in John chapter 2. And when I was going over this, once again, my, my, my soul is, is, was so edified. And I thought to myself, this is not, this was something that I saw that in, in, in an out-of-body ex experience of being teleported back in time. That's what happened. And I was praying to God for that to happen too. And I could never... Obviously, you can never have enough of those experiences. What happened, what I saw, what was happening in, in, in what I saw is exactly what's happening in John chapter 2. Beginning in verse 6, says, Now six stone jars. I didn't see six stone jars. I saw approximately two or three of them. Because my it, it was like just a, 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 a portal. It was like a, a window. And... I didn't see everything around. I just saw a certain amount, a certain area of where this was taking place. So I couldn't see much beyond Jesus to, to his side, to either sides. It, it was kind of like uh, a, um, a video recording in, in a, uh, you can adjust the, the width of the, of the band, I guess, and, and uh, of the, um, of the recording and that's all you see that's what that was like and in chapter 6 in verse 6 of chapter 2 in John the Gospel of John says now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons so this water was used for the purification of the Jews. Each holding approximately 20 or 30 gallons, and that's that's the size that I saw. That's what they would hold. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And I saw this when, and, and they filled them up with, with, to the brim. Now, what this represents, Jesus Christ, when he was filling up, he, was, he had his servants fill up the water vessels, those water jugs, the water jars, the, the earthen vessels, what they represent is a human being. And those servants represent um, disciples of Jesus Christ. In verse, in verse 8 says, And he said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it, and when the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. So this is the 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 um, the stewards 
they're they're you know they're um, drinking from their their own vine. They're drinking from their fruits that they've sown. God multiplies that the work that is sown. He multiplies it upon the sower. And and he took it to the feast to the steward of the feast. And of course, this represents the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, taking it, taking, giving everything back to, to Jesus, also giving God the glory. Taste of the water now become wine. And did not know where it came from, the steward of the feast. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom. This bridegroom represents Jesus Christ ultimately. And in verse 10 says, And said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. And when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. So what this means in verse 10, the wine here represents, you have the, 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 the good wine, that is the new wine, and in Luke chapter 5, 37, speaks regarding the new wine. And that wine is not aged. So it does not have a... Um, it just, it's just not refined. It just doesn't have that, that uh, pleasing taste and aroma to, to it. So in verse 5, it says here... In verse 5 of Luke chapter 5 verse 37 and no one puts new wine into old skins if he does the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed but new wine must be put into fresh wine skins and no one, after drinking the old wine, desires the new, for he says the old is good. So, in Luke chapter 9, verse 58, also gives us the answer. In Luke 9, go to Luke 9, 58, also it says here, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What this is saying is that the wine represents the covenants. Okay, first you have here in Luke chapter 5, says, Jesus said, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. These, this is new wine, is a spirits, and old wineskin is a, a human being. The wineskin represents a human being. And the wine represents the spirit. So an old wine, for example, here, what Jesus is speaking of, he's regarding the end of that covenant. It's an old covenant. What is old says in Hebrews, the new covenant is a better covenant. It is the new covenant. It is the, the new wine. It is better than, than the first covenant. And that's the old wine. And now also, this, Jesus said to John, when you were old, verily, verily, when you were young, you clothe yourself and go wherever you want to go, but when you become old, someone else will gird you, someone else will clothe you also, uh, and, and will take you somewhere where you do not want to go. And we're there right now as well. However, when Jesus came and did this in the time of the first covenant. He was, he was there in the first covenant. It was not the second covenant yet. He was bridging. And what he's saying is that if you take new wine and put it in old wineskins, the new wine will burst. The skins will be destroyed. 
The new wine will spill and the skins will be destroyed. This means that they will reject the Holy Spirit. And the skins of the, that holds the wine will be destroyed by the devil. Now, in Luke 9, 58, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, Herod. Birds of the air have nests. Okay, these are the, the Pharisees. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his Holy Spirit. His head. The head of Jesus is physical. Christ is spiritual. The head of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. Of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And Christ is the Holy Spirit, the Savior, the Messiah. That means Savior. And we are saved now when the Holy Spirit is poured into our souls and transforms our souls into a likeness of the soul that saved us. And that's the soul that saved us is Jesus Christ. His very being. In verse 38, but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. So now he's speaking regarding the covenant. Jesus breathed into his disciples after his resurrection. And then on the day of Pentecost, the fiery tongues came. So what happened is when they were drinking this new wine, it was spiritual wine. It didn't have alcohol. The the drinking was like receiving the Spirit of, of God. And, and it must have been very, very merry. It must have been a wonderful uh, thing. They were really high in spirit. However, that was the breath when God breathed into his disciples. That was the, that was the likeness of that effect. It was like a heavenly effect. That they received. They were joyous. They were rejoicing. The bridegroom was there. And so that's what that represented. And also, it's, and no one after drinking the old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. What this means is that at the end of the age, they were in that frame of mind. They were. Um, they didn't know God, as Solomon really, really says well, shows well in um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. They did not have no clue of the covenant of God. They had no idea of the Holy Spirit. So the old wine here represents the old covenant. He didn't, they, did not, they weren't desiring Christ, it says in Isaiah, that they did not desire him. They hide their faces from him. He was poor. He, he left his home business. He didn't have money. He was homeless. He was like uh, he was like refuse uh, for the church goers. And so that's what this is saying. No one after drinking the old wine desires the new wine. That's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the covenant, for he says the old wine is good. They, were, they, they didn't know what was happening. They had no idea. They were in complete denial and they were conquered. They were overthrown in the wilderness. So here, to explain the spiritual wine in Luke, um, in John chapter 2, in John chapter 2, in verse 9, when the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, he didn't know where it came from. That's what they said regarding, that's what the, the blind, the, the man who was made to see was blind, said to the Pharisees, I mean, this is a marvel, it's a wonderful thing in itself. You know, you don't know where he came from, yet he opened my eyes. He did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew so, so, so their, their eyes were open. They were working for, for, for Christ. See, Christ, he was like, you know, like one of these, the one famous, famous evangelist I heard that 
he would just, just his presence, his shadow would heal people. Well, how much more Christ? Being around Jesus Christ. The stewards of the, the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. So first you drink the, 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 the good wine, the new wine, and then after, when everyone is drunk, give them the, the new wine, because they won't know the difference anyway. But it says here, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is speaking regarding the Holy Spirit. The new wine is the new growth that is the disciples of Christ of this second covenant, speaking the Holy Spirit speaking through them. But you have kept the good wine until now. So this is regarding Jesus Christ. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, here's another clue, and his disciples believed in him because the Holy Spirit was in the drink. You see, it was a, a first coming. He was, he was perfectly bridging. Now, in this report also, refers to Ephesians 5.18, which I will speak regarding also. And also, by serving spiritual wine at the end, Jesus Christ was, is, prophesying the mingling of spirits in the ends of the earth. And here I can add Luke 11, 34 to 36. And so what happened here in John 2.10 was the mingling of Luke, what, what Luke 11. So there was the, the, the old wine, the first covenant. They were drunk in the first covenant. Spirits, that's the teaching. That's the spirits, the bad, the bad spirits. And that is of the alcohol that's of the earth. There was no salvation there in that alcohol. In, in any alcohol, even today. And th the Bible sh says that. And I'm going to read just a couple of scriptures. And his disciple and, and in Luke 11, Luke 11 says, once again says, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is sound, your whole body is full of light. That's the Holy Spirit. But when it is not sound, and your eye is looking at, you know, pornography, your eye is looking at, is evil and demising evil things and seeing bad things and seeing bad thoughts. That's your chakra. That's the, our inside. That's our soul. That's the entrance of our soul. We're imagining these uh, people are, are imagining really, really bad things against other people. And uh, this God is spirit. Worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. So we have to tame and control all these spiritual uh, wicked, evil desires. But when your eye is not sound, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. Then, so it says, if then, your whole body is full of light, having no part dark. It will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the lamp with rays that gives us light. Just his presence. Now, having no part dark, that's exactly what was happening when they began drinking the spiritual wine. There was no, there was a mingling there. And that mingling represents exactly what is happening in humanity and exactly written down in the scriptures. Amazing and awesome. The scriptures, the scriptures once again is like an almanac. The scriptures tells you exactly what is going on. It's the best news report that anyone can ever receive. Uh, how, how wonderful are those feet, are the feet of those that come and, and, and give good news. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ.
So Hebrews, once again, is, tells us regarding the better covenant that we're in right now. And regarding uh, drunkenness in Ephesians 5.18, this is mentioned here also in this report. In Ephesians, Ephesians 5.18 And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And that's exactly what happened at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. They were drunk with wine, and then they got a filling. They got a, uh, a part, mixture, a part of the Holy Spirit. Some of the Holy Spirit going to go into them. And... So Jesus would not have served them wine with alcohol. Once again, he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. God, the Son, did, would never have manifested his glory with an earthly tool. That's why kingdom dominion theology is a lie. We cannot usher in anything, God with anything that is of this world. God is above this world. We use things as this world as if we don't own them. Now, so Paul here is given the instruction to the church saying in Ephesians 5.18 do not uh, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. This is not negotiable whatsoever. You can't you, you cannot read you cannot get away from this. This is a this is doctrine, this is a part of scripture that must be put at the forefront when dealing with alcohol consumption. So in 2 Timothy 2:5 you see that the, the Bible explains to us even different levels of fellowshipping with God. For example, in 2 Timothy 2.5, it says here, in the King James Version, says anyone who is striving for masteries does not get he doesn't get crowned unless he does so lawfully. So, what is lawful is to follow the ordinances that the Holy Spirit is giving us to do. And what this is saying is if we want to be perfect, before God, as perfect as we possibly can be, to completely, to fulfill the complete desire that God himself has for us as individuals, uh, that involves being sober. Being sober means not getting drunk on alcohol. Being sober means not taking marijuana. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that to condone drinking is to enable it. In the same way, buying marijuana is enabling the drug industry. So this is being enabling just as what Paul writes also in Romans. He says not only do they approve, uh, not only do they um, allow these things, they actually approve them that do so. So what this is saying, they're actually enabling them Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. The Bible says to be spotless and to be blameless, as Christ was spotless and as Christ was blameless. So, in, in this situation, in the, in the wedding of Cana of Galilee, the wine that, that Jesus, the water, this is the wine of Jesus. Jesus made this wine. Jesus 
this this wine came from Jesus himself. It, it's, it's not as if someone served him. He was actually serving. And he is the Holy Spirit. And we are to be like-minded when we are ministering to others. So I hope you're edified. God bless you. And I thank you. And uh, I hope you're edified.